Good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, good morning, folks. It is July 24th. It is the Lumberjack Landlord here to deliver some amazing news. For those of you who follow the channel, no, it's not that. I'm still not retired. However, lots of fun stuff going on in the market right now. We're obviously all hoping for big rate hikes. Can you tell I already have pool hair? Yep, it happened. Um, but super excited to be here with you guys on another Sunday morning. We've got lots and lots and lots to talk about. Lots more doomsday videos and horrible things coming. Um, I think that no matter which side of the aisle you're on, no matter which side of that you're on, at the end of the day, we still have to live our lives. And so I think the key is, is an understanding how that might directly impact us. And so one of the things I really wanted to make sure that we covered today was I think a lot of the people posting stuff on YouTube have no idea what they're talking about, but they have big audiences because they're really good at marketing and they have really excellent clickbait. So based on that, what I wanted to do was actually share with you, I don't know, experience, expertise. You guys can know exactly where I'm coming from and then you make your decisions. Um, I, like my good friends, um, Mike Zuber from Orange All the Time and Dion Talk Financial Freedom, we just like to share what we see, but then we give our opinion, but that's, again, that's our opinion. And then if you align with that, fine. If you don't, that's okay too. So we just want to share kind of all the data that we're seeing in the market. Um, so we'll talk a little bit about, it's really interesting kind of watching the 10 year go down. I think that, I think that wall street's doing everything it can to show, to show the fed that the everything's in trouble. So don't raise rates. Um, cause the people that are most addicted to cheap money is wall street. Um, those that don't have trillions of dollars in cash is sitting there, but, uh, let's talk about it. I think there's a lot, um, you know, I think that there's, yeah, there's just a lot, there's a lot coming. Um, so for those of you who don't know me, 121 units as of, uh, Friday, 121 units, um, 41 buildings, I specialize in small multifamily. I don't do single family homes. They don't cash flow anywhere in my market. Real quick tip, before you move markets, move assets, move asset classes. If single families aren't working for you, look at twos, threes, and fours. If there's not that much inventory, it's okay. Slow and steady can still win the race. In my market, to give you guys a, make sure you just a real brief review, I've got three towns or cities that I do business in. The cumulative population of those three cities is less than 50,000. Correct. Less than 50,000. So I had to build mine over time. I had to be slow and steady winning the race. I had to buy property that only made sense. And now I own 121 units in those three cities of about 50,000 people. So it's a, a you know significant part of the market, if you will. But over time, slow and steady wins the race. Um, but we always do the questions. I'm super excited to be here. Would love to have you guys ask all the questions you want. Newbies, sophisticated investors. If I don't know, I respect you enough to tell you I don't know. I'll always give you my opinion, but my opinion is based on my experience. So it doesn't make it right or wrong. It just makes it what my experience was. So there are things that I've learned in doing things the wrong way. There's also a lot of things that I've learned in doing things the right way that I think will help people out. So we're here to answer questions and we're going to go for as long as we possibly can today. I got to admit, it's 95 degrees here where I am in New Hampshire, and my pool is calling me. There's reasons why I bought my pool or my house with a pool. I would never put one in. Quick tip. <laughs> so super excited to be here with you guys. Again, Lumberjack Landlord, 121 units, 41 buildings. Um, I buy off MLS, wholesalers, off-market deals. Um, I've bought off a Craigslist. I bought off a Facebook marketplace. I have bought homes pretty much anyway. I, the only thing I, and owner-based financing, the only thing I haven't done is a sub two deal yet. It's the only thing I haven't done. Um, and I, and I own units anywhere from single family, only one or two of those up to, I think our biggest building right now is like 12 units. So it's really well diversified. But anyway, I digress. Let's get jumping into the questions. And then we're going to talk a lot, um, just answering your questions, but really talk about, you know, what's coming. I think, I hope they do hundred basis points. My guess is it's probably only 75. I hope they do hundred. Um, we really need to start ripping off this bandaid a little bit faster because I know that in talking with all of the people that I work with on a weekly basis, 
the their most their largest expense right now is everything. It's gas at 450 a gallon for regular gas, 575 a gallon. We're getting ready to start our um, our winter season here. And when I say start it, usually we start looking at negotiating our contracts for fuel prices um, because we buy so much fuel. So we'll reach out to a, you know three or four different companies and say, this is how much fuel we bought last year. What's the best price that you can give us? Um, and let them know that I think last year, I want to say we went through probably about... probably about 15,000 gallons, I would say, 15,000 gallons of oil and propane we went through for our, all of our properties. Um, but there's been some shifts to our portfolio. So I think as a whole, I'm not scared for the American economy. I think we'll be just fine. That doesn't mean it's going to be without pain. There definitely will be some pain. But with the housing market doing what it's in, doing what it is, there's no better time than right now to be doing your homework, understanding what your market is, because then you'll be able to watch and track as things go flat, then they go to decline. And then we see if that decline starts to pick up or if they stop raising rates or if there's, you know, or if recession gets really deep and then all of a sudden, you know, the Fed stops raising rates or people are, you know, putting bad products out there in the market, like pick your own rate for two years, like they did back in 06. Um, then we'll start to see some of that. We'll start to see us, people that are looking to invest in the market, being able to take advantage of that. So that said, I got a sneeze coming on. I'm just going to warn you when I reach for this real quick, it's because I'm going to do a massive sneeze and I'm a triple sneezer at least just FYI. So hopefully I don't sneeze. <sighs> so on my magic elixir, it's not alien vodka. They still don't sponsor Dion's as much as they don't sponsor mine, but that is a sugar-free watermelon drink. And it is delicious. Uh, Kenny A, greetings to all. Matt Bittner, good morning. Hopefully the Fed gives us 100 basis points hike next week. I completely agree. That will absolutely help the economy. Dion Talk Financial Freedom. Uh, every time uh, you hit the like button, an angel gets his wings. That's true. I've seen it. I've seen it happen. Um, good, Dion, for you to be here. I appreciate you, my man. Dion and I are doing, we, well, we did the video on retirement on Friday. And then his live stream is this Tuesday at 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern. And I'll probably be hopping on that for some time because I think he's I think he's sending me the link. So I, I might be able to hop on that sometime. Gina Santiago, good morning, Matt. Thank you for all your comments on the deep dive house hacking yesterday. I was very happy to do that. For those of you who don't know what Janet's talking about, we did a deep dive yesterday on house hacking, which is, I believe, the fastest way to get rich. Period. End of story. I will go up against anybody proving my points versus their points. And again, it's not to say that I'm smarter. It's only to say that that is a faster way of getting rich. It just factually is. I've not seen anybody else's strategy that gets you richer, faster, in a more meaningful way than that. And that is not getting lucky. If you did that in the stock or in crypto, some, you know, some influencer coin that went to the moon, congratulations. Look how that's gone for most people. It's almost always a pump and dump. I haven't seen one that isn't. So all due respect to the crypto crowd, you can do it, you can make it happen, but if you don't cash out, it doesn't matter. And you're also going to owe 50% taxes on it too, FYI. Uh, mm, uh, yes, Jan Santiago, we have to. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the house hacking thing is critical. That will be live on one rental at a time. You guys can watch it later on today. I think it's going to be live at, uh, in, a, in the next few hours. And that was myself and Dion kind of hanging out, talking about what we've done and how we've become millionaires. Um, because we know that anybody can do it. Mandy W., good morning. Vatzel, good morning. Johnny Cashflow Ramirez, my man out there. I see him on his feed, man. He is pumping every day, every day. And that's the grind, my man. You're doing it. Donnie Bear, good morning. Donnie, good to have you. I'm not sure if you've asked a question before, so I'm excited that you're here today. Janet Santiago, we have we have to do more live stream with you. Yeah, I'm, I'm open to doing uh, live streams will become even easier, what's really funny is, side note, Dion and Mike's schedules are worse than mine. And I have three kids under five and a full-time job. Their schedules are tougher than mine. True story. I love those guys. Um, Chris Webb, good morning. Good morning from Central Virginia or Central Vermont. Oh, in our neck of the woods today. Super cool. That's the best. Sorry, guys. I have contractors in the field. We have contractors in the field. So we always, always will look 
to make sure that everybody's okay. Yep. Yeah, we got pe- I know people are actually working today. They're nuts. They're nuts. One guy was like, hey, I've got another, another job that I got a deadline on this week, but I still want to spend some time on your job. He's literally taking out a chimney brick by brick. No joke. <laughs> it's awesome. Um, so yeah, he's actually was working yesterday at 95 degrees. Matt Bittner, Lumberjack Landlord. Have you ever done a 203K? Um, and if so, is it a difficult process? Yes, I have. Yes, it is. I have more detail I can give you on that. Yeah, it's a difficult process. Um, it's really the most difficult part, believe it or not. In most states, they require a, a licensed GC. In the state of New Hampshire, we don't have GC licensing. So the most difficult part of the 203K loan is not getting approved. The most difficult part is getting the contractors to fill out all of the nonsensical paperwork that they have to fill out about the project, the budget, the materials, all of that stuff. They have to fill out all of that stuff. And then even when they finish the work, then they're typically waiting 60 days for payment. So when you look at that versus them, it's kind of like Section 8 housing. It's a lot of extra steps. It's less money usually um, than what the market is. And so that's largely what those loans are. They're fantastic. I've done two of them. I couldn't have done those projects without that loan because that was at a time where I didn't have any money. Um, So they were very valuable to me. But if you need the money, you got to pay in the process. And yeah, it's, it's a lot. It's a lot of steps. It's a lot of phone calls. It's especially now when contractors have more work than they know what to do with. You're almost guaranteeing yourself that you're getting somebody that's newer or somebody that doesn't have a very successful business, because if they have the time and they're willing to fill that out and they're not a friend of yours, it's very, it's very long. It's a, it's a lot. It's really is a lot of work, Uh, but well worth it if you don't have the money. So Chris Webb, excited to have you here. Matt Bittner, hopefully that answers your question. And Chris, good to have you here uh, in my area. Ryan Allen. Hey, Lexi, good job watching this with dad, getting smart. We'll help you get rich Can buy all the stuff you want later on in life. I mean, all the stuff you need. Uh, that's all. Matt, I received a sub two deal. Okay. The issue is that the loan amount and repair costs would exceed the ARV. It would cash flow day one after repairs. I don't want to be in a stock situation if the loan gets called. Yeah, I get that. Yeah. Um, in all honesty, that's all. I, cer- I certainly understand the, the dilemma. Um, I don't know how likely it is for a sub two deal to get called. I think that they're more likely to get called in a market where it's very likely that on paper, that house looks like it has a lot more equity in it than it does, is my guess. So for anything sub two, I would absolutely be watching Pace Morby as much as you can watch him. I watch Pace because I'm trying to learn that skill. Um, And also Ryan Nichols also out there as well. Um, So yeah, I think think both of those guys are good. I think they're both, Ryan Nichols good, Pace is great. Pace is just awesome. And Ryan Nickel likes to take his shirt off all the time, which I'm good with. Like, I, I'd rather watch Pace. Sorry, personal commentary. Um, Phil Nealon, good morning. Hey, Phil, good morning. That's all, sticky situation. Yeah, it is. And the thing is, that's all, I'll only talk about stuff that I've experienced and done. So having not done a sub two and not knowing what the economy is going to do or having an, an exact idea of what it's going to do in the next 12 months, I would be concerned about that deal as well. Even if it cash flows, even if it cash flows, I don't know what the likelihood is that they're going to start calling those sub two deals. And boy, would that put this market in a world of hurt. And certainly a few individuals for sure. Cash flow Jenner Ramirez, I'm calling for a hundred point move. Yeah, I see it. Yeah, I agree. I think I think they need to. And it's been talked about now. If I think it's 34%, 34% in the, of the market expects for a hundred points. If it's that high, you need to deliver the hundred points. If it's that high, because you basically have street uh, approval from more than a third of people, there's a third that'll never that never want the hike, right? And then there's a third that are kind of like could give or take, and then there's a third that's like, hey, listen, we need to take some medicine, but let's do this, let's do this now, and try and rip the bandaid off because we know one thing's going to happen: the market's going to tank when that goes 100, even if 34 percent of people believe that it's you know coming. So. It would be great now if they did something crazy like a point and a half, like or a point and a quarter. Like that would reshuffle the deck real quick. 
Um, Ryan Allen, do you have any walkthrough videos of your one of your remodeled units? I would like to do a kitchen and wanted to see how you how yours look after a remodel. So Ryan Allen, I do. There is a playlist on my channel of um, they're, they're the oldest videos on my channel because I started off wanting to show you guys the difference between me and kind of everybody else. Um, I can work the finance side. I can work the deal side. I can work finding the properties. A lot of guys can do that, but I'm hands-on. And so I pick all my products. I do all my own design work. I pick my own color palettes. I know the appliances that go in, hence my landlord review series, which I apologize. I had two videos I, I wanted to get out this week. I actually had trouble getting the materials to my house so I could actually do them, but I have them now. So we're going to do those this week. Um, guaranteed, which is going to be shark bite and the door package that I use. But yeah, Ryan, if you look on the playlist, there is a playlist out there um, of my rehabs, walking through them, showing actually the work in progress. So you can see the countertops I use, the cabinets I use, all that stuff is out there. Um, Yes, Kenora, Matt the Man Machine. Thank you, my friend. I appreciate that. You know what? Every day is Monday. <laughs> All right, chat moving. All right, here we go. So, uh, Daniel Riccani, I hope I spelled your, I said your name right. I apologize. Um, thanks for the question. Uh, U.S. ten-year yield put in a head and shoulders pattern. Yep. Closed below the neckline on Friday. Yep. Mortgage rates follow the ten-year. Yep. High probability that mortgage rates crash in coming weeks. They're not going to crash. They won't crash. Nope, they won't. They won't crash. They'll go down and they'll go down quickly. That's what bear markets do. Bear markets are not all down. Bear markets are much more volatile than a bull. You know, bear is, that's where a lot of people get bears wrong. Yes, the end result is down, but bear is much more fluctuation, much more booms and busts. Um, but again, rates, 50 basis points in a week, that's a massive move, but crashing, they're not getting anywhere near the 2.5 that they were last year, or even the 3.1 on a 30, they are not getting anywhere near 3.1 on a 30, especially because our fed funds rate is what one, two, five. Now, if they do a hundred, it's two, two, five. And every bank makes at least a point and a half of margin. There's no banks that do a point, uh, like a point of margin. There aren't, not that I've ever found, not that are reputable banks that I've ever seen. So you're looking at a point and a half. So even let's just get nuts. Let's just say that they do the hundred points and we're at 225 and that upsets the market and the 10 year goes down. Even if the 10 year goes down to 225 or 21 or two, it's still going to be a three and a half to, to 3.75 mortgage rate because at the end of the day, the banks still need to make that margin on that money that they're lending out. It's narrow margin. They make money off the margin because they're not holding the debt. They're selling the debt to Fannie Freddie. So for them, it's a margin and servicing day. So I don't disagree that they're going to, that we're going to see ups and downs. Absolutely. But you will see, I believe you will see that when they add the 100 basis points, even 75, we're not seeing three again. For, a, for quite a long time, unless we get deep, deep into a recession. Still about margin. Um, let's see. Golden Crespo, good morning all. Great three series videos this week. Oh, three amigos, a bit controversial, but enjoyable and wise info. Thank you guys. I mean, again, just so you know, I mean, you guys know us. If you've watched the channel at all, if you watch the three amigos, we don't go out there to make a stink. And like, that's not our, that's not what we do. What we honestly do is we all consume, all three of us, we consume a lot of data. We really do. We consume a lot of data. We then, if the answer is there and what they're saying, here's the information, or we turn it into information. But then we give you our honest opinion of, do we believe that this is going to make an impact? If so, what? Do we believe it's not going to make an impact? If so, what? I actually really respect my subscribers. I really, truly do. There is... Um, one of the people that responded to one of the videos this week and said, I'm in some, um, I'm in some syndications and they're going super awesome. Awesome. That's great news. I don't think that all syndications are junk. I think that most of them are going to be in trouble in the next two to five years um, because most of them count on rents increasing. 
Most of them count on appreciation for the ability to be able to refi. And most of them have not baked in the fact that they could be looking at rates that are double what they have for paper now, because those rates on commercial paper, they're going to get more scary because there's going to be more defaults in that area than there are on the housing side. So that's my opinion. You watch and see. That's how I'm investing. So I'm not just saying that and then doing the exact opposite like a lot of channels. I tell you exactly what I did. I cashed out refied on 23 properties over the last um, 10 months. I did it at a, uh, I think my blended rate, which means all of the loans together and where they're at are four point uh, are four and they're 30 year fixed rate debt based on the product that I had my bank that I worked with my bank to make. Uh, I had to make a product and that video is on my channel of the numbers and what I took them through to have me make them make that product. They're a smaller local bank, one billion to two billion dollar bank. So they're more flexible in, for being a community bank and not being a, uh, you know, uh, the big five, if you will. So um, I appreciate that you guys also understand that while we're doing this, I don't take this, this isn't, this isn't life or death stuff. It just isn't. And so for me, I like to joke around. Graham Stephan, he's definitely a fan of two of the Amigos. He left a comment on, on our video. I know that he loves the two Amigos. One Amigo he probably isn't a big fan of. I think he's just jealous because I do a really good impression of him for what it's worth. Um, but yeah, I think it's, uh, but it, it was fun to do. And like I said, he's a stand-up guy. He answered most, of the, he answered some of the questions, but not really all the questions. Um, but I think that some of the advice that he gave out is bad. That's uh, for the, for the average person. If you have a YouTube channel that does, you know, and businesses that do 10 million bucks a year, bite your hair on fire, have a blast, do whatever you want. Like, cause then largely your financial decisions on a day to day don't make a difference. But for us, grinding it out on the daily, still working a W-2, even though I don't have to, I value and I work hard for the money that I make. And so I'm going to, and I'm going to give you the opinion based on how I feel about it, because that's all I'm good for. Um, Johnny Cashville, hit that thumbs up. Thank you, Johnny. I appreciate that. Always appreciate the thumbs up. The YouTube algorithm doesn't particularly like me, and that's okay. I want to be here for the people that want to be doing the work on the daily. LV teach me. Hello, everyone. Hello, LV. Good morning. No code on. Good morning, Matt and everyone. Don, good morning. Good morning. Catherine Miller crew. Good morning, Matt and everyone. Hello, Catherine. Good morning. Uh, Lori Fiesel. Hiya, Matt. Hiya. Uh, how to interview handymen. Okay. I'm not the least bit handy. Yep. And many older homes in my market. Got it. Haven't made first purchase yet. Good. That doesn't matter. You're doing the work. You're learning, you're understanding what you're going to get into. I like this. Um, but no seller of great shape triplex from 19th century. Maintenance frightens me. Don't be afraid. Have, just level with them. Hey, just want to do the inspection. I just want to know what I need to get on the list to make priority for things that might need to be addressed. So you can let them know. It's not a slight on the building. It's not trying to get out of a deal. It's, I would love to, I would love to own this building. Be honest. I would love to own this building. The only thing that concerns me is I'm not the least bit handy. So I just want to make sure that I have somebody go through it that's more handy than me. And then they can give me kind of a list of, hey, here's kind of the things that you need to be uh, aware of. And then the time frame associated with, you know, or the, the, what they believe the time frame should be. Um, the thing that I would encourage you to do is when you're looking for an inspector, I would look for an inspector that has a construction background, not a, I passed my test inspector. Um, there are plenty of pass my test inspectors that are, that are decent at what they do. However, they will never hold a candle to a construction guy who's actually done that work, understands the work that goes into it. And if he's done it in the last few years, also knows what it costs to do it. So I always recommend for me, I actually, even for me, I have all the experience. I've done all these projects. If there's a building that I have questions about, I bring in somebody that has a construction background. A lot, sometimes the bank requires an inspection and that's fine because they want to make sure what the size of the building it is or the size of the investment that it is, that they make sure it's not a dump. So I have to hire somebody, but I always like to hire somebody with construction experience because when the bank then says, 
yeah, we're really concerned about X, Y, or Z. Guess what? I can say to them, I actually had it looked at by a construction guy. And he's saying that that's not a fifteen dollars or $20,000 thing. That's a $3,000 thing. If they are scared at all, the worst thing that they'll do is they'll make you put the 3000 bucks in escrow. If it's a $3,000 thing. Well, the worst thing they'll do is cancel the deal. The next worst thing they'll do is say, well, okay, but you're new at this. We don't have a lot of experience. This is the value of working with a local bank because you're having a relationship with a person. You are not a number. Once you get really good at stuff, Rocket Mortgage all the way. I love their process. It's super fast. It's easy to get through, but they don't know the first thing about your local market and if something is a bad street or not. They don't know any of that stuff. So my recommendation, always people with construction backgrounds to look at that stuff. And that way they'll send an email and say, yeah, you know, I took a look at it. I understand that the inspection report says it's a concern. However, even if this was something that had to be taken apart and redone, it's 3000 bucks or 5,000 bucks or whatever it is. Then you at least know that going in too about what it's going to cost. That's my tip to you. Hopefully that helps you. Let me know if it doesn't work. Uh, Rich Boudreau. Hi, Mr. Matt. Hey, Rich. Rich. <laughs> Rich, I appreciate your comment. Rich probably took it. Rich actually admitted that he got a really good laugh out of the video. I appreciate that. That's why I was doing it. I was not doing it to be mean. I don't care if people make fun of me. This better do a good job at it. Like, honest to God, have you ever heard that imitation is the sincerest form of flattery? Like, yeah, the guy's got 3.9 million, Scram 7 has 3.9 million subs on his channel. He clearly figured it out, right? Figured it out. He's crushing it. I don't agree with some of his real estate advice. It's because, guess what? I make way more money off my real estate than he does. Way more. I would listen to anything he has to say about growing a YouTube channel. <laughs> I'm not saying I would do it all, but he has more credibility there or three YouTube channels. Um, Kanor, where, uh, where can I compare rents best? Kanor, um, so that's a great question. Um, I have the concept, if you're in Mike Zuber's course, um, where, he where he talks about the concept of a buy box, I have something I call a rent box. Um, I think I shared that either on my website, Lumberjack Landlord, or I, I think I shared that somewhere. I think we did a video on it. I'll, I'll try and make that form available. Um, but that, that rent box is exactly the same thing as a buy box for rents. So some people use Rent-A-Meter. I don't particularly like Rent-A-Meter. Um, some people use Zillow to see what else is available on the market right then. I don't like that because in most markets, Zillow is the number three or number four place people go for rentals. So where I go, Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist in my area, and then I also look at section eight or housing. I look at that number because I know that's what my basement is. That's what I'm guaranteed to get for the unit, period. So if I use that number, I'm always pleasantly surprised to the top side. I've never seen a section eight or housing rent number that was below what I get on the market for it. Why? Because I would just rent it to section eight and I'd get the number. It's literally that simple. So I would look at Craigslist. I would look at, or try and find out. I would talk to a rental agent too and ask them, where's the area that, you know, that you guys post the most stuff? You know, if I want to, if I want to look at what apartments are available on the market, where do you guys post? Where, where do you find that those are posted most often? Some might say Zillow. It's not, it just isn't, not in my area. So it really is area dependent, but it's almost always Craigslist and Facebook marketplace are the most often trafficked areas uh, for rentals. And then you can, then you start to build your rent boxes kind of the same way that you build a buy box because you can see what goes up on the market. You can see the quality. The difference there is you, you have to score it. Is it, is it uh, you know, what's the quality of the unit? Is it A, all brand new? Is it B, where it's newer, but not brand new? Is it C, where it's dated, but it's clean? Is it D, is it falling apart? Um, and then when you're able to scale it like that, you're able to really try to pick your number of where you want to be. Um, for me in this crazy market, when I had tenants move out and I wanted to move in new tenants, I picked it an obnoxious number and I saw how many people we had filter in on that. And then how many qualified people we got from that. And believe it or not, I could not pick a number that was too obnoxious. We had some that were 45% raises in rents, um, in some cases, and, I still got it rented and I still got it rented within a week and not a, no vacancy whatsoever. Matt Bittner, you can't have capitalism without bankruptcy. 
Um, largely that's true. There has to be a consequence to taking a gamble and then you need to get put in the penalty box for seven years. I'm okay with that. I almost went bankrupt three times in the beginning of my real estate process. I got hit with a lead order. Um, we had, we went from eight payers to three payers to one payer that almost tipped the scales. Um, what else? Oh, when city shut down my should have probably not said the name, but I did. When they shut down my uh, my HELOC, I know of what I speak. They shut it down. I'd just written 20,000 bucks in checks to finish the project or to take us to the next phase of the project. The rest of the project, I was actually going to have to fund out of my own pocket. Well, that left me literally destitute with no money, not even enough to pay the bills. And I was at, I had a $14,000 a month, maybe $15,000 a month nut. And I had a $5,000 a month income. Let me help you out with the math. It was negative. It was bad. So that would have sent us into bankruptcy very quickly. Very quickly. Um, Matt Bidner, I wonder if 203K loans could get easier due to the likely coming recession. I believe they will because contractors will have time available. Um, and there's any time you have that transition from a hot market to a recession or from a hot market to a, to a, a you know, kind of a fast moving downward trend, Contractors always get stuck with some or, you know, one or two or three contractors or contracts that don't pay. It does. It happens all the time. That's why I value my subs so much that as soon as they're finished the job, somebody sent me, hey, we're finished the job. And I just said, hey, can you send me pics when you finished it? He's like, yes. And that was Wednesday. Um, he said, I got to go take pics. I forgot to take them. I said, you know, the rule. As soon as I get that pick confirming and I can see it's done, I'll write you the check. So he said, I'll be up there on Friday. So Friday went up there. It was a couple of roofs that they need, smaller roofs. Um, he sent me the two pictures. He said, okay, can I come pick up a check? I said, yep. Within an hour, he was here and he got his check for 12,000 bucks. Rich, you and the team, amazing job. Really appreciate you. Fantastic work. That simple. No games. No, I got to wait for the bank for this or figure that out or wait on this. You get paid, you finish, you get paid. And that's why guys will drop projects, other projects for me, because they know if they need money, they can simply put in a weekend's worth of work or five days worth of work. And as soon as they're done and it's confirmed, they get paid, no games. If you're on my job site, I have the money to pay you, period. So yeah, Matt, I agree with you. There is definitely going to be a point where, um, this the recession will bring on 203 people being able to or wanting to do 203k loans for sure. So I see 59 people watching. Appreciate y'all. Feel free to ask questions. This is what I'm here for. I don't do one-on-one -on -one consulting because it's be it'd be these same three hours that I give every week. And so I want to make sure that if you do have questions, you can feel free to ask them below. And there are no stupid questions. I will not make fun of you. I make fun of people for other things, for things that they deserve to be made fun of not knowing where they are in the housing process. That's not something anyone deserves to be made fun of. I'll give you direction, but we don't make fun of people for that. We do make fun of people real quick. I just have to say one thing in regards to that video. I appreciate everyone's support, recognizing that I was being funny. I also want to make sure that you guys know, I find a level of irony in somebody that tells people cut out the $4 latte when they were given a multi-thousand dollar espresso machine. So he still gets his espresso multiple times a day, still gets it, but he was given the machine. Didn't have to pay for it, number one. And number two, I actually like watches. And so I use watches for me in my life. I use watches to commemorate cool things. So I didn't commemorate my kid's birth with a watch because I knew that I was going to have a bunch of kids and I'd like to buy nice watches. And so I bought a watch when I got my first job running a product line for all of North America. I said, if I hit my goal this year, I'm going to buy myself a really nice watch. I did. When I was ranked the number one rep in the world for a company out of 817 or 818 reps, when I won that, I bought myself a watch because that was something worth commemorating. Anytime you're number one out of 818 of anything, it's pretty good, especially when they're all very well compensated individuals. Um, 
And then I bought another couple watches, but other things since. I bring that up now to say, sometimes you'll see me with a really nice wristwatch. That's totally true. Those, that's one of the few things that I'm like, I like to buy those things because I remember what each watch was for. Graham does the same, but, but he's talking about four and five dollar coffees. I'm not. I think the place that you save your money is house hacking. Number one. Number two is he bought a $52,000 watch. Now I'm not saying that that's stupid or it's a bad investment because there's plenty of watches like that that go up because they're limited edition. I am just saying it's a little hard to take when he's grind, 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 talking about, you know, his guacamole toast and doing it at home and all these other things, because you could literally have espresso every single day for the rest of your life. And it's not going to be $52,000, which is what you spent on one watch. That's my only point. All right. Phil Neal. Would be cool to see a video of all your sound mitigation techniques, product review in one spot, carpet on stairs, walls, ceilings, over garages. I'm actually doing that. I have a building that we're doing that in. And so I am literally setting up with the film crew. They're expensive and I don't mind doing it. Obviously, it's a net loss for me, but I think the education will help everybody. We'll try and make it part of my course too. We'll put on the channel to begin with. Um, I will be able to show you that in the coming weeks. Um, we've got a project that's underway right now. Um, we are just waiting for electrical and plumbing to be finished. And then we start the process of sound. And then we go to, and then you'll also see the sheetrock that's installed, the special sheetrock, and you'll see exactly what we do. And and um, in combination with the window combination that we use. So you'll see that. Aria Centers, morning, Matt. Hey, morning, guys. Happy to have you. Craig, Craig and Cam, I think, I think it's Cammon, but let me know. Um, most syndicators I've seen have promised cash out after five years based on lower rates. What happens to the investors? Are they stuck? Is there opportunity there in the future? Um, yes, yes, they are stuck. Um, yes, they could get in very, very big trouble because what ends up happening is, is if you can't refinance the debt, then you are, then you are subject to the debt resetting. Here's an example, 3.75 debt. They might've gotten four years ago. Okay. Or three and a half years ago, that thing's getting due to reset. The new rate for commercial for that product is seven and a half. It's double meaning your payment is about to skyrocket. The problem is, is that a lot of times they'll, they'll say, oh, but look at the returns, look at the returns. Bye-bye returns, bye-bye. Those returns aren't gonna be enough with the fees and the management to then maintain any level of profitability. What they have to do at that point is the bank also looks at it and says, you also need to have a cushion. You need to be making profit. We need to see that on a monthly basis, you still make profit with these new numbers. If not, do you know what they do? They make you put an influx of capital into the deal so you're not managing at a negative rate or zero cost or at too narrow of a margin, which means that they have two options. One, go back to the investors and say, we have to do another raise of capital for that same deal or two, we have to sell the deal. Maybe you can get a deal. Maybe, maybe they can get an exit on the deal. Maybe they can't. And so that is how syndications fall apart. Now, there are syndications out there that actually buy in a rate lock where it's like current rate plus 200 basis points. And their numbers might not be good on the increase of the 200 basis points, but they still can make the money that they need to, to keep the doors open and hit the reserves that the bank needs to see. However, it's now no longer going to give you this great return on your money. It's going to give you a garbage return. So you might've gotten a nice return for a little bit, but now you're going to get a garbage return. So I see that being the biggest issue for these syndications is their debt structure. The fact that in almost all of the deals I've seen, they account for um, they account for the asset going up in price, 
which is going to be tougher to do on a 400 unit building. They expect the rates are going to rise and they expect vacancies in many cases. I saw one that counted, they counted a vacancy rate on a 400 unit building at 1%. No freaking way. There's no way on a 400 unit building that you at max have 16 units open. Stop. No. Yeah. 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 Sorry, four. What did I say? 16? One. It's one. It's one percent. Yeah. There's just no, there's just no way that happens. There's no way of four units open. Stop. On 400, give me a break. That's ridiculous. So that's where I think. So I agree with you, Craig. I think that there are going to be opportunities, but I think the problem with those opportunities, I don't think they hit the market. The way that a lot of those deals go is Fannie and Freddie, believe it or not, backs a lot of that stuff or banks do. What they do is they'll, instead of taking the property back, they'll actually have a negotiation with the owner of the property and they'll talk to another um, an, another organization that actually owns those same types of assets. And then they'll have a conversation with them and say, this is what we can do for you. Because sometimes it's like the crypto thing, right? Where you gave out a $300 million loan to another company, they went belly up. That means your 300 million is gone, or you're going to have to wait for bankruptcy. And then that makes you very illiquid. And so then that starts the domino effect of other things going negative on your balance sheet. Same exact thing here. And so they'll actually look at an asset and they'll say, we want somebody else to show us that they've got the returns that, that they say they have. And then we'll just say, you know what? We'll let you assume this debt. We'll let you do it at this. And at that point, there has to be some sort of a workout. A lot of times with the other organization, they'll say, we need you guys to recapitalize the deal, meaning go back out, get more money and throw it into the deal. There are going to be syndications that will go belly up. There are going to be syndications that make a little bit of money. There will be syndications that will be successful. The question is how successful? Um, Cause there's syndications in all sorts of stuff um, in malls, in large multifamily, um, in storage. Um, there's some that do them even in like dock slips because dock slips can be really expensive too. Um, but depends on what you believe. There's like, on Lake Winnip uh, is it Lake Winnipesaukee? There's a lake around here where there's like a 20 year wait. Oh no, it's Sunapee. There's a 20 year wait on a dock slip. And so when one comes available, there's actually been dock slips that have sold for $200,000. So crazy, I know. Brian, how is the Vegas search going? Good. Is this other Brian? <laughs> it's really funny. Brian, who asked that question, my realtor, my broker is also named Brian with a Y in Vegas. Uh, so search is going well. Um, there are now in May, the first week of May, there were 2,200 homes for sale in Las Vegas, 2,200 homes for sale in Las Vegas, the first week of May. There are now coming up on 7,000, 7,000 homes for sale. I'm feeling pretty good. My buy box is shrinking, but growing. It's shrinking in what I can look at because I can only look at so much stuff. It's growing because the number of listings coming on in that buy box is still rapidly growing. Now, there's still still deals closing. There's still our deals closing. Um, not negative numbers, not even close. Um, in fact, I still haven't seen down from like three or four months ago. I'm seeing more transactions or, or fewer transactions, more of a build, more discounts, but I'm not seeing negative numbers. Not yet. Not yet. Um, for those of you who are watching today, just put it on your list of something to watch this week. Brian Lebo, my broker, um, check him out. He just did a video on open door closed for business. I think is what the name of the video was. He crushes it in that video. It's something that we've talked about. It's something I've talked about with Mike, with Dion. We've all had that conversation. Um, they are seeing most, a lot of their properties that they're listing in Phoenix are less are listed for less than what they paid for them. A lot of them, because they're trying to catch the falling knife in the market. 
Phoenix is going through adjustment quickly. Their stock, I want to say their stock a couple months ago was a, a couple thousand homes, maybe 1800, something like that. Now it's like 10 or 12,000 homes. It's a ton. It's a lot, lot, lot. Um, Don and Ben Perkins, good morning. Good morning, guys. Kenora, thanks so much. I was thinking about an Excel list rent box, so now I need to do the work. Cool. Yeah, I'll try and uh, um, I will. I thought I had that out there. If you don't see it out there, just let me know if you don't see it on the site and I'll have it posted. G Waters. Hi, Matt. I'm thinking of refinancing a paid off duplex to buy a few more rentals. The rate is 7.25, 30 years opinion. So without knowing all of the rest of your entire financial situation, don't post it in the box. Um, without, I don't know. Here's what I can tell you. In the deals that I did, so I put right out the window. In the deals that I did, I did them because at that rate or at my rate that I got, it still A, cash flowed, and B, it allowed me to buy more property. So that was the criteria that I used was A, it's still cash flowed and still cash flowed as, as well as any other asset that I would buy in the market. So I didn't make it something that would only give me like an 8% return when everything else in my portfolio gives me 20 plus. If the deals in my portfolio, it makes me more than 20, it nets me more than 20% return on my capital, period. So that's the methodology I use, which is so long as it returns me over 20%, so long as it's not getting me over my skis in value, so no more than 70% loan to value, and I'm going to use that money for my next deal, that's what I do. So let me, you know, see if that kind of fits your criteria. Eric, um, hi, Matt. Do you have any experience on what kind of repairs an FHA loan wouldn't allow? Um, heating systems. It has to have a functioning heating system. Um, bathroom has to have functioning bathrooms, has to have a roof that works. Um, it's really safety stuff. Um, like a deck, it has to have proper rails, railings. Um, those are the big ones. Those are the big ones. Sometimes it will be where they say, um, we had one fail that had, a, it was an older house that had horsehair plaster on top of lathe board. And there was a bunch of areas where that was cracked. And they said, oh, that's a $25,000 project. I knew, I know my bank. I reached back out to them and I just said, you're out of your mind. That guy doesn't know anything he's talking about. 25,000 bucks. Tell you what, I will bet you that 25 grand that I can do that project for less than three. Her answer was, while I like, well, I believe you and I'd like to be able to do something about it, I cannot. So I had to quickly jettison that FHA deal and I had to do it on a conventional deal. Yeah, true story. That was actually, excuse me, that wasn't, uh, yeah, that was, oh, well, so that was a Fannie Freddie backed loan, not FHA, my, my apologies. But it's the same type of stuff. They have a grading system for the quality of the property. And if it falls into, I think it was, was it D? or E, if it falls into that quality, they won't write the loan. So then the only other thing that you can sometimes do is you can sometimes do like an escrow. Um, what I did was I went back to the sellers and said, there's nothing I can do about it. But if you give me a discount, I'll close and I'll close with cash. That's what I did. So I got a $10,000 discount, which actually fixed all the stuff that they called out. Plus that let me add in a couple of new kitchens. Sad, but they were going to go through that with any other buyer and they wanted to close right then. They had to close. That's all. Hit the like button. Thanks, that's all. I appreciate that. Rob, Matt, are you retired yet? No, still. Oh, I didn't bring, I didn't change my name. Yeah, still not retired, Rob. How about now? Still not now. And now. Nope. Rob, Rob, what's going to be awesome, Rob, is that when I do retire, Pink Panther's coming to you, my man. Every day. Matt Bittner, if everyone buys an espresso machine, we can all band together to put Starbucks out of business. <laughs> I think they're going to put themselves out of business fast enough as they continue to have all these small shops unionize because I've had friends that work for Starbucks in 
uh, shift leader, store manager, uh, you know, general manager for a store. I've had friends that have worked in there and yes, there's, yes, there's profit of course, but um, I think people would be surprised at the cost of doing business, especially like it's expensive to open up a Starbucks. They're corporate, but it's expensive to open them. I can tell you what it is on a Dunkin's too, a Dunkin' Donuts. A Dunkin' Donuts to buy the franchise, I think in the last nine years in New England, there has not been a new Dunkin' Donuts franchise owner because anyone that comes available, it's one of the big guys that buys it up because they know everything about putting the place up. Yep, but there are underperforming Dunkin' Donuts as well. Oh, people did not like that union comment. 15 people jumped off. Listen, I'm not picking sides. It is what it is. It adds a cost. And that's that's the comment, is it adds a cost. And so when it adds a cost and they're a business, you know, on the other side, um, who was it that just shut down? Chipotle. Chipotle shut down a location. They shut down a location because people were going to unionize. So it, it, it adds a cost. Ba, 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 ba. Lianvo, best way to make current le, uh, best way to make current leaving tenant to schedule couple showing times to screen next tenant. Convenient for tenant and work for self managed landlord. What's the best way to do that? I think just open communication, which is hey, at the end of the day, we want to, you know we totally get you wanting to leave, but what I would do is I would actually put something up and just say. I do open houses. So I say, okay, from Saturday, from 11 to one, that way you're not impeding on them. You've been promote the heck out of it on Facebook marketplace. You promote the heck out of it on Craigslist, um, any other local landlord groups, um, any other like student boards and Facebook, wh wherever you can promote it. And then you just literally just open it up and for two hours, and then you're just there. And then you have people just literally tour through. Um, and you're likely going to get somebody from that. I've done it both ways where I've had them just tour through and I've had, you know, 30 or 40 people show up. I've also had it where um, all of those people over the few first few days, we pre-qualified. And then we had a list of six or eight that could go in there in that one, two hour block show it to all of them. And then we usually get two or three people from that that are a good fit for us, that meet all of our criteria. When I say good fit, it's just really about meeting the criteria that we set out. So that's that's something that I've done. Uh, hopefully that helped you. Kip Stevens, hey Kip, good morning. Sorry, sir, sorry late, no worries. No worries. I'm as cool as the other side of the pillow. Rob, you need a watch to celebrate when Dion stops sending you the Pink Panther. Well, that that will happen because I will get one when I retire. I am shopping now. I have two or three favorites. I have two, well, there's one watch that I've had my eyes on for probably six years, seven years, six or seven years. It's one of those ones that I've watched. Pardon the pun. Um, six or seven years I've had my eye on that watch that might be, but it's more expensive. And so it would have to be something really big. Like I retire in all likelihood. Here's how messed up I am. I'd probably retire. I would buy that watch and I would buy it with my vacation time that I'm trading in. <laughs> that likely will be the budget in all seriousness. Nah. That's the Pink Panther. That's what Dion sends me. He just sent that to me. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> um, ba, 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 ba. Sumesh. Hey, Sumesh. I'm, you've never asked a question before. Excited to have you here. Uh, paid my $1,000 deposit for a house in North Carolina. Is it still worth it to buy a home in this market? Impossible to know with all the information you gave me. Um, impossible to know. It depends. Um, you have to evaluate that for yourself. The reason being is that for me, if I had a job in an area and um, we only wanted to move once. And so I bought a house that literally I knew we weren't going to utilize a third of it until we finished having kids. Once we finished having kids, 
the whole house will be utilized. We'll be in one place. We won't have to move. We won't have to change school systems. We won't have to do any of that stuff. So if something changes in life, we could. But the key for us is, is that we took, a, we took a very long, what's called a time horizon for us being where we are going to, where we're going to live. So um, that's the way that we evaluated it. And I think everybody evaluates it a different way. Um, I didn't buy this house going, man, I hope I can exit in two years and get a big chunk when I leave. I didn't buy it saying, man, if this thing goes down, you know, $200,000, I have to sell it. Nope. 30 year fixed rate debt. I could afford the payment. That's, that's how I judge it. And it was where I wanted to live. So that's how I judge it. Hopefully that helps you, Sumesh. Julie Anderson, what do you think of getting a bridge loan? Ugh. I don't like bridge loans. I don't like them. I don't like them because it's short-term debt and it's too easy for, let's say the market goes really poo-poo. I don't have a crystal ball. I don't believe it's going to go really poo-poo. But if it does, the last thing that I would want to have is bridge debt because it's expensive. And what happens if, if, I can't ref, if I can't get it refied? What are the consequences to that bridge? That's all. I'm moving to a new city and would like to house hack here. Cool. How do I build a buy box for the new city? Where do you, where do you, where do you don't know? Oh, where you don't know the areas. Okay. Um, that's just research. You need to be, you need to be finding local brokers. If you're looking for a four, three or two or one, right. Or four, three, two or four, three or two. I would be looking up MLS in the area that you're headed to. I would be looking at the agents that sell the most fours, threes, and twos. I would be reaching out to those agents and explain to them exactly your situation. Say you want them to set you up in an MLS search, do it with two or three brokers. Um, and then tell them that, hey, the first one that brings, just so you know, it's always going to be based on the first person to get me a deal or get me into something um, or show me something is the one that I'm going to do the deal with because that's the right thing to do. Open, honest, full disclosure. Do not sign. Do I would not sign an exclusivity agreement because you don't know that that agent sucks and they like exclusivity agreements for 90 or 180 days. You don't want to be down that path. So do that to then learn the market. Then over the next 90 days, you'll really learn the market. Then you need to make sure that you actually go. And so for even for us, we're looking at Vegas. I've driven all over Vegas. My wife and I are weird. When we go out there for vacation, I will take a day, I will rent a car, and we will drive areas. We've driven Summerlin, we've driven Henderson, we've driven, we've driven um, Red Rock, um, Desert Shores. Uh, those are the areas that we've driven the most. And it's because I want to see it. I want to get a feel for it. I want to see it, want to get a feel for it, see what the, see what the neighborhoods are like, um, you know, that my wife can walk there safely with the kids, that they have playgrounds, that the house doesn't have a playground, that sort of stuff. So that's all. That, that's what I would do. That's the, that's the area that you want to get into, I think. Dion Financial Freedom, I want you to watch the Three Amigos video we did on Graham, but think about him watching it. Yeah, I think that's a good idea. Me or everyone else? I already watched it. I watched it with Ashley that night. She was like, what is all the noise about? And I was like, maybe, just maybe, I was being funny. And dealing in the hyperbole of funniness. And we watched it and she was like, oh dear God. And I was like, you know, this is how I am. She goes, I do. She goes, I do. But I don't know that anyone else thinks it's going to be as funny as you do. I was like, Rich Boudreaux thought it was funny <laughs> and a few others. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Um, Keith Hager, what does title insurance cover if the seller still had liens on the house and the title company did not do the due diligence to certify clear title, then they are liable. That's what title insurance is for. They are liable to the tune of they are certifying that you are getting a clean title. If you don't get a clean title, it's a claim against them where they have to clear it up and make sure you get a clean title. And that means if there was 50,000 bucks in liens, tough. They have to pay it so they can actually give you a clear title. 
That's, ex- that's how title insurance works. That's why it's also when you refi and when you buy, every single time you actually have to acquire title insurance, which I think is garbage because I think that lets the previous guy off the hook. And he's also usually double dipping because I'll usually close with the same closing company. So then they double dip and I just paid them $725 twice. I've literally had them find something the second time around. Oh yeah, we missed this. Oh yeah, you're going to have to fix it. That's what title insurance is for. That's what they have to pay for. That's on them. Great question, Keith. Uh, to, to, to Brian. Uh, to, to, to. Brian, you should send the video of Kevin O'Leary. I know, right? So I like Kevin. He's probably my favorite shark. I like Kevin. Um, I like Kevin the most. He's my favorite shark by far. And then maybe Cuban. Yeah, probably, probably Cuban. But yeah, O'Leary's watch collection is ridiculous. Like he has like, I think he has over a thousand watches and he doesn't buy junk. Like he has some watches. Oh yeah, yeah, I like this watch. And and it might be a thousand or $2,000 watch. He has watches that are hundreds of thousands of dollars. He's a shark. Like I get it. Like you can afford that stuff. Maybe someday, but probably not. Brian video, uh, Brian, G, yeah, Graham Stefan video. Yep, I've watched it. I've watched it because I like Kevin O'Leary. I watch his stuff. Yep, I watch his stuff. Uh, Craig Kamen, uh, thanks. Great feedback. You pronounced my name correctly. Awesome. Thank you, Craig. Uh, Brian, our name is spelled the same, but I am not Brian Lebo, though I live in Vegas and watch his channel. I know your name. See, that's why I, was, I wasn't sure which one it was. I think you'd come up as Lebo. But anyway, good, good stuff. Cashflow Johnny Ramirez. Matt, I continue to try and network. Good. I invest two and a half hours uh, away from where I live. Yep. What's a way to make the right connections? Um, I think if you're that far away, if you really want to make more connections and strong connections, it's aggressive, but I think you'll, you'll find it worth its weight in gold. You got to get in the market at least a day a month for an event. You got to get there. You got to be seen. You got to be a player. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, no one, excuse me. No one knew me. Then they started seeing me. Then some people got to know me. And we just crossed kind of the final threshold where now agents are asking the selling agents if I was the one who bought it. That's the one I really wasn't looking forward to, quite frankly. I, I would much rather stay underneath the radar, <laughs> my Lamborghini, which I don't have yet. I would much rather stay under the radar, chill, cool, quiet, just doing our deals. But we bought so much and there was so much competition on those deals and so many people lost and so many people lost with higher offers. We just are much, much, much more better than them at closing. We just are. We have a much, we have a very specific way that we get people on our side where we lock them into the negotiation and we deliver, we deliver, we close. We have never not closed. We deliver on the results that we promise. And so our reputation is that, that we deliver. So yeah, I'm going to continue to, what was that kid's name? Chris, I beat you in the last three deals. I'm going to keep on beating you too, until you overpay until you way overpay. And if you get one, congratulations, you overpaid. I'm the worst, I get it. Uh, Rob, LOL, yeah, yeah. Right now, yep, that happened here in Maine with Chipotle. Yeah, okay, I thought it did. Yep, I thought it did. Listen, at the end of the day, my wife was a union nurse. She was also not a union nurse. She was both. So I can tell you, based on that experience, There are pluses and minuses to both. Fact. There just are. So, yeah, it's not you have to be this or you have to do that. Nope. There were experiences with both. And she had some good experiences, one and not the other. And she had some bad experiences in one and not the other. Like, they, it happened. 
bad experiences are not specific to being unionized or not being unionized. They just aren't. It's all how it's managed. Lori Fiesel, back to older properties. Yep. What are the major factors an investor should review over and above what we look for in any property? Um, I, re I really stick by just the big stuff. I really do. It's the, it's the furnaces. It's the foundations. It's the roof. It's the insulation. And it's the electric. It's the big stuff. That's really what it is. It's the, it's the big stuff. Yeah, it's really, it's really, it's really the big stuff because whether a house is like, there's junk that was built in the eighties. There was, there was just stuff that was built in the eighties. that was complete garbage. Um, or it was built in a neighborhood where there was a lot of clay in the soil and there's a lot of, almost all the foundations are cracked in some way, shape or form. So it's really just the big stuff. I don't, where I'm really successful in looking at a property is I always figure in my mind, there's probably 10,000 bucks right? Um, there's probably 10,000 bucks of make ready, make lumberjack ready the way I want it to be. So I kind of count for that pretty much in every deal. There's 10 grand of my make ready that I'm going to put in there. Um, Cause quite frankly, if there isn't, the property's too finished, it's too done. It's going to be too expensive and it's going to go to somebody that's willing to overpay. And that's not me. So if that kind of fits into that, which is like, Oh, it needs updated vanities in the bathrooms uh, it needs some carpet ripped up and some carpet redone. I'm not thinking about that stuff. You can think about it when you have that tight budget, but for me, I don't because I can like I can have them clean for 400 bucks, 500 bucks. They're good for at least another year, and then I know that I in a, a year from now I'm going to want to save up and get those ripped out year or two whenever the tenant that comes in then leaves. Um. So I look at the big stuff: roof, foundations, insulation, electrical, plumbing. Um, you know, I look at, I look at that big stuff that if you have a foundation problem, um, windows can also be a big expense, you know, windows can be another big expense, but those are the main areas. Like a lot of homes that I buy, I mean, I, I have one that we just bought. Um, it was single pane windows. It was literally, and it's right next to a busy street, but it's in a downtown area there are 22,000 cars a day that pass the front of that building. If you follow me on Instagram, Lumberjack Landlord on Instagram, you'll see the picture of the red building and then a gray building. Red is what it looked like. Gray is what it is now. But we, those windows that were in there, those were junk single pane windows. Those single pane windows, crudely speaking, you can hear a fart outside. Like they're useless. They, they're garbage. So we ripped out all of them. And when we ripped out all of them, we did what's called an STC 35 window, which means it's rated for 35 decibels less than a normal window, 35 decibels less. And if you know how decibels compound, that's a significant noise reduction. Now, two things, has to be installed right, and it's much more expensive. But when you look at the sound or when you look at like these older buildings, Phil Nealon on the sound thing, it's about the entire envelope, my dude. It's about the entire envelope. It's the windows, it's the siding, it's the insulation under the siding, it's the insulation that you're going to use in the cavities, it's the three mil plastic you're going to put over that, it's then the quiet rock that you're going to put on the walls, though, and you know, using it with strapping and attaching it to strapping, it's all of those things that then give you the best envelope that you're going to have, right? When you're looking at old from a construction perspective, those are all the things that are big money, right? When I went with normal windows, it'd be like 10 or 12,000 bucks. With STCs, it was 18, just under, just under $18,000 for that window setup, 18 grand. Um, but yeah, the insulation, I wanna know that the wall has it. So most inspectors, most construction inspectors will have what's a, a called a FLIR thermal camera where you can literally hit the wall and it gives you a picture and if you can see that it's black and it's during the winter time, then that's a cold spot. It can also show you hot spots. You can see very quickly if it's uniform in its temperature, then you actually are in pretty good shape. If it's non-uniform in your temperature, then there's gaps in the insulation and you will have a hard time keeping it cool or hot. And that's just something to know when you're going to buy that house. Let me know if that was 
helpful, Lori, and you can absolutely keep on asking questions to that end. Eric, hi Matt, any experience with unpermitted, unpermitted additions? Um, I had one, I went to the city, I said, this is unpermitted. They said, yes. And I said, what do we need to do? And they said, we need to get in there and just make sure that it's safe. So I had to rip apart some, I had to rip some stuff apart. Uh, it probably cost me mm, 5,000 bucks, 5,000, 7,000 bucks to get it ripped apart, proven, a couple things changed, put back together. But it could also be horribly bad where they tell you to tear it down. That's a big California thing. California's big on tearing stuff down. New Hampshire, not, not so much. They want to make sure it's safe so they'll go through that process, but they're not there to be like, just go, just tear it down. That, that's not their answer. It's let's do the work. Cashflow Johnny Ramirez, I've had realtors not want to work with me because I will not sign the exclusive contract. And I'm okay with that though. You should be. Because you know what? They better get okay with that because life is about to get a lot more difficult realtors who don't work with an open mind. You're working with an investor. You know how many deals Johnny Cashflow Ramirez is going to sign over the next five years if you just get on your ass and do the work? I actually have a, this Wednesday, I have a presentation. Um, this Wednesday, I have a presentation with a big time realtor that sells realtor classes and the whole nine yards. That's one of my messages lock me into an exclusive. You really think I'm going to sign an exclusive with 121 units? I have an idea. Show some value. Bring me a deal. Bring me a deal and I'll show you how easy I am to work with because I am really easy to work with. I'm not going to hit you with stupid things like, well, I don't really like the color. Well, you know, the, the kitchen is a little bit dated. Oh, is that a sump pump in the basement? Oh, oh, is that a granite foundation? Don't care. I don't care about that stuff. I assess it based on what's there and then give it a value. That's what makes me easier than mom and Joe homebuyer. That's why realtors love doing business with me. One of my realtors actually said we had done, I think, 2.7, 2 4, something like that. We did 2.7, 2.4 million dollars worth of deals last year. And they said, I have less time into you in those deals than I have into one of my buyers that's buying a $380,000. That, that's price range is like three fifty dollars to four hundred. dollars They ended up finally buying a three eighty dollars house. And he goes, and it's been a, such an absolute nightmare. So I'm telling you, agents, I'm telling you, you need to expand your horizon and recognize that you get to eat what you kill. So start learning how to be a hunter and not a farmer. Doesn't take a whole lot of skill to pick up a phone. Hi. Oh, you wanted to see that house? Yeah, sure. Let me show it to you. You're going to be going, oh, hi. Oh, yeah, this is the 17th call today. Sure, we can list your house. Yep, let me come right out there. That's what it's going to be like. That's the difference. It's going to be a typical, completely different thing. Um, Rob, Matt, what do you think of Lake Las Vegas? I think you mean Lake Mead. I think you mean Lake Mead. Ah, uh, scary. Yeah, scary. Um, it's not turned me off of, uh, off from shopping in Vegas. I have not bought in Vegas yet though. So make sure that we kind of keep those two things understanding, right? I want to know what they're going to do there. I'm not buying right now. I'm going to buy probably this winter or the beginning of 23 is probably what I'm going to buy, but I want to see what they're going to do with Lake Mead. It's a problem. It's a big problem. And I don't know. So I've watched a lot about it. I've done a lot of research. I don't know what the answer is. So I'm waiting for people that deal with water and dams and aqueducts to make that decision. I think California is probably more screwed because I think that their contract is over for that, um, over for that water supplying. Um, Eric, any real estate CPA or tax preparer recommendations? Yeah, I actually do. Um, Bob Langworthy in, um, he's out of Maine, but he does, I think he's done 37 states. Bob Langworthy in Maine, <clears throat> there are tax preparers, there are CPAs, and then there are EAs. And yes, I purposefully put my hand out of the screen. 
there are EAs, enrolled agents. Every year, an enrolled agent has to pass a test to keep his EA status. That test that he passes are the new rules and regs of the IRS. You have to know it cold, just that simple. So I have an EA. I, I just changed this last year. Uh, he is absolutely getting a Christmas card. Um, he was amazing. He was transparent. He was responsive. He was asked great questions, put me in a better position than I've ever been in based on my holdings, worth its weight in gold. Bob Langworthy, out of Maine, Maine bean counters. That's who I use. You may have a different experience, but that was my experience. He was phenomenal. Um, his staff was phenomenal. Um, but tell him the lumberjack landlord sent you. Maybe that means something. I don't know if it does, but I loved it. I love the experience. I, I, um, let me put it this way. It was such a good experience that I wished I had left my other accountant. Um, I wish I'd left my other accountant years ago. Really do. It cost me, it cost me tens of thousands of dollars not leaving my other accountant. That was my mistake. I'm in charge. That was me. My bad. Kim Stevens, SOS Properties. Hey, Matt, just curious. I don't think you're Curtis. To why we always see Dion on your live, but the third amigo doesn't come asking for a friend. <laughs> Um, I think Mike doesn't consume a lot of YouTube. Dion and I do. Dion, Dion does, I do, and Millennial Mike does. Yeah, we consume, a, a, honestly, we have an unhealthy addiction. We watch way too much YouTube. Um, and I think, and that's where Mike is very structured. He's very structured. He is seven videos a day on his channel, period in the story, daily financial news. And that's his, that. That's just him. That's what he does. That's his process. Um, oh, cool. Thank you. Rolden found the, the live stream. So let me see if I can. Um, Rolden, let me see if I can do something here. All right, I'm gonna try this. Rolden, don't make me regret it. Rolden, now see if you can post that thing. And don't worry, I'll come back to the questions. I just wanna see if that. About Lake Las Vegas, not Mead. Rob, sorry, I just saw your channel. I know, don't worry, I'm gonna get back to it. See if that lets you post, my man. Rolden, if you're there. Rolden and I roll the same way. We usually have a baby and a baby Bjorn or actually a little baby. Funny story, not small. Baby Bjorns don't fit me. They don't have long enough straps. <laughs> so I have to wear a little baby. It's a different brand meant for beefier dudes. I know, it's funny. All right, Rolden, let me know if that worked, my friend. Um... Don, I bought a Tudor Fast Rider. Okay, Ducati, watch, watch on accident. Okay, forgot to ask the price before they rang it up. Still sitting in the box. Oh, okay. Very cool. Tudors are nice watches. Yeah. I, I um, One of the nicest watches I ever got, I didn't pay for. I won it in a bet. True story. Uh, it was me, another sales rep. The other sales rep was mouthing off, being a jerk about stuff. And so I said, dude, I'm going to absolutely smoke you. Without hesitation, the hubris idiot says, want to bet? Absolutely, I want to bet. I'm going to crush you. He goes, what do you want to bet to be? I go, uh, loser buys the winner, a nice watch. And he goes, what's a nice watch? And I go, not that piece of garbage you're wearing. <laughs> he goes, what's a nice watch? And I go, 
right now, Rolex, the, the oyster perpetuals are running about three grand. That, that was then when I made the deal, they were running about 3000 bucks. He goes done. He goes, I'm going to obliterate you. I said, dude, you have no idea who you're messing with. I'm going to slaughter you. And so then it ensued. And then my entire, the entire national team of my division and the entire national team of his division, like the, it made, it made Q4 of that year. I can't remember what year it was. It made Q4 of that year a lot of fun. It really did. It really did. And I didn't just beat him by a little. I think he did about a half a million bucks in revenue. Um, and I did $1.4 million in revenue that quarter. I obliterated him. And so he bought me. He bought, I, that was the deal. That was the bet. And he tried to get out of it for a little bit. And I go, I wouldn't do that if I were you. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom. Um, and so, yeah. So he ended up buying me. Uh, Actually, I told him, I said, I don't want him buying a fake. I said, so you need to send me the check. This is the watch I'm going to get. Send me the check. He sent me the check. And I went and I bought a used Rolex. <laughs> I didn't buy a new one. So I bought a used Rolex and that was my trophy. So yeah, could I could have lost, but not today. Not that day either. Um, Kane Q. Uh, will you be underwater with some properties if rent prices decline? No, not even close. Mm -mm. No, um, if rents, so if I'm making 20% on the money I have into the deal, eventually the money that I have into the deal disappears, right? So I get my return on that capital. But then once I have, let's say the initial $100,000 back that I put into the deal, at that point, it's just making money on my mortgage payment. Well, even if they go down, let's say rents go down 10% or 20%, no, it's, it's still not close. I still make money on all my properties. Yep. Yep. So, and in, since 1914, rents have never gone down for a five-year period. Never. Never. And they, it was largely market. It was a specific markets that it went down in. So for me, if my market goes down, even if it goes down 10% or 20%, not even going to be a thing. Then honestly, um, even the Section 8 housing number is a significant premium on what I need to make on a monthly basis on the property. Um, what we would do that at that point is if we had to like batten down the hatches and tighten things up, we would just do less improvement. We would still do maintenance, but maintenance, because we redo most of our properties, isn't that big. The big expense that we have right now, the $500,000 a year that I spend on my portfolio right now is capital improvement type of projects, roofs, uh, decks, uh, new flooring, new kitchens, new bathrooms. Um, we have a half a million dollars in what I would call shovel-ready projects ready to go when we're ready to start spending. You know, when we believe that the economy is kind of dead or there's stagflation and a bunch of, you know, contractors I work with in the past have, need work. Um, my guys need to stay busy. We will always do that. We will always keep our guys busy, but we'll just sub out. We'll do less subbing out. So yeah, rents, rents, largely speaking, if they go down 10, 20%, it's not going to affect me. I just, I don't expect that to ever happen. If it does, that's okay, but I don't expect it to happen. Brian Cuban is a boss. So he is, he is kind of a dink um, in some ways, but he's by far the most successful person on that panel. He's worth, I think like four or 5 billion. He's had a lot of flops though. Cryptocurrency starting, like he's the, he's the one with the most recent flop. He got his clock cleaned in that um, Voyager, I think. So he got crushed there. Um, LV teach me definitely our pros and cons and unionization, former UAW member. Yeah. So my wife was a unionized nurse. My dad worked for I, IBEW, International Brotherhood of Electrical Workers. Um, so yeah, there's pros and cons to it. You know, just like there are with everything. There's no, this is the only right way to do it thing. There just isn't. There just isn't. It's much more the devil's in the details, get in the details and understand where the devils are. And then some companies need to have unions because they don't treat their people to even a certain standard. And when that, you know, when it's a really tight job market, 
those people leave, right? But when it's not a really tight job market, they just have to deal with it because of whatever status they might have in their life or um, or for any number of reasons. So that's why I'm not like, every union ever has been bad. I'm not like that. In fact, um, the student that bought that uh, property, he's, I, he's International Brotherhood, I think out of Boston. So yeah, I it, different different strokes for different folks and different rules apply based on what the business is. World and Crespo, Kenor, here's the rental box video. Oh, let me just scroll down and see if you got that. He did. There he goes. Awesome. So if you click on that link, guys, don't do it now, but you can cut and paste it. Um, but if you grab that, that is that is the rent box video. Thanks, Rolden. Um, Eric, what kind of window blinds do you use and where do you buy them? Um, I use I, I overspend on this. This is again, it's one of my it's one of my pet peeves with apartments. Um, they are usually between 35 and 65 bucks. So I can easily spend a thousand to twelve hundred dollars on them. Um, I like the cordless um, with the with the honeycomb. Um, so no cord, honeycomb, and then you just adjust the bottom piece down. Um, Home Depot has those. And so you can usually wait and look for a sale where you can get those on sale. Um, be wary of the specific site because some have really good cutters and some don't, as far as people that know how to do that, order them. Don't go in, you know, go in, pick them out and say, here's the measurements I need for everything. And then go back uh, and pick them up. Do not wait for them. It takes them forever. They are slow at it, which is fine. Um, but that's what I'll do. And so for a typical 20 window house, I can spend a thousand bucks, 1200 bucks on blinds. <clears throat> but it, again, it looks beautiful. It just does. When I redo a unit, it looks beautiful. In a dated unit, I will not use that same blind. Only because there's usually something there in the dated unit that matches motif. Um, ba, 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 ba. Keith Hager, other factors on older homes, lay of the land, water runoff, zoning, no cliff houses. <laughs> uh, can you mow the yard, drive neighborhood with the windows down in your car, go at night and look at zombies? Yep, yep. Yeah, I think, so lay of the land's important. Usually, so on the lay of the land and water runoff, usually that's the basement thing. That's what I'm looking for in the basement is you know, is there mud in the basement? Is there a water trail in the basement? Is there a sump pump in the basement? None of those things are necessarily issues. It is something that you have to know that you're going to have to maintain. Uh, cliff houses, um, haven't done one of those yet. Um, can you mow the yard? I see. What, so mowing the yard, what he's talking about is topographically, um, what it, what it, how it's landscaped. So I actually have most of my yard that's perfect. And then I have one part of my yard that's a big, huge hill that I hate. And it, it's the bane of my existence. And so I'm literally going to bring in probably 100 yards of fill and build it up so it's not so obnoxious the way that it's set up. So yeah, for sure. Uh, Daniel Smith, two NH relocation questions for you. Okay, cool, Daniel. I'm happy to help. Are there any areas that are reasonable commute to both Portsmouth and Manchester? Yep, sure. Any resources for finding rentals up there other than um, Craigslist, Facebook, and Zillow? Uh, so really good question. Um, you could be um, decent, decently distant if you're Stratum, S-T-R-A-T-H-A-M, Stratum, Exeter, E-X-E-T-E-R. And this is 90 minutes into the video, uh, Daniel. So Stratum, it looks like Stratham, um, Exeter, um, Epping, E-P-P-I-N-G, Epping. Um, that's about midpoint for you. That's about midpoint. Those are the, those are the, um, I would say it probably goes Stratum, Exeter, then Epping as far as quality goes, as far as quality goes. What you're looking for is stuff along what's called the, 120, uh, the 101 corridor where you can like in Stratum, 
In, in Stratum and Exeter, you can pick up 33 and go north um, into Portsmouth. So it's a little bit longer for the Manchester person. Um, but if you're close to 101, they can hop on 101 and they're in Manchester in 25 minutes. Um, Epping also, that's even closer to Manch, uh, Manchester. Um, and, but both of those areas are good. You can go as far as um, like Chester, which is decent, which is about a 40 minute commute to Portsmouth, but only about 15 to Manchester. Um, Cause Portsmouth to Manchester is about an hour, 40, about 50, 50 minutes, 50 minutes. So Stratum, Exeter, Epping, Chester, Portsmouth, Stratum, Exeter, Epping, I should do that backwards, actually. Portsmouth, Stratum, Exeter, Epping, Chester, Auburn, Manchester. Let me know if that helped you, Daniel. Um, as far as other places to look for rentals, um, I would I would connect. Um, find a rental agent. I don't know one in that area. Otherwise I'd be happy to help find a rental agent in that area. I just don't know any that's out of my market. My market is North of Portsmouth. It's the three towns North of Portsmouth, North and East of Portsmouth. And yes, directly East is into the ocean. I know my geography. Lori Fiesel, uh, you hit it with the STC 35 windows. Awesome. I'm a longtime renter in all sorts of buildings and the lack of uh, oral protection, yep, is my biggest fear in single family home turned multi, moved out ASAP, um, like the insulation inspect too. Yeah, hopefully that helps you. Um, yeah, definitely get somebody with a FLIR camera and please, if you're buying something old like that, please, 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 when you find the inspector, make sure that you pay them a couple hundred bucks to camera the line. They have to camera the line, the sewer line. Old homes have gone through the process of having in the street, they can have cast iron. They can have something called a uh, Bermacoat, which is literally paper wrapped in tar. Hate it. And it was put in a lot in the 60s and 70s and now is causing a ton of problems in the last 10 years in, in older homes. Um, so please have them look at that line. That way, you know, that it's not collapsed because if it is collapsed, that's an eight or $10,000 repair. Please have the line camera. Um, Eric ceiling fan recommendations or where to buy. Okay. Eric, good question. So ceiling fans. Um, I love what are these? Casablanca's. So Casablanca Fan Company, I love mine. They're awesome. They're ridiculously expensive, but I love them. I do. They're fantastic. Um, the other ones, um, it, you really just have to size it right for the room. I personally like the flush cut ones more. I also like the ones where you can reverse the direction, where you can actually have them sucking up the air instead of blowing, you know, recirculating hot air, have them actually sucking the air up. Um, to then kind of circle it through the room. Um, yeah. Yep. And those are um, Casablanca. Casablanca is the one that it's expensive, but they're quality. Um, what else? We've put in some of the nicer ones from Lowe's, usually like 175 to 250 bucks is usually the price range of what we'll do for a ceiling fan. Stainless, um, low profile. Um, we try and get as big of uh, a blade as possible. That's the best I can give you. Kipsy, um, Dave, Dave, David and Dave. Hello, everyone. Hey, Dave, good to have you. Um, Kip Stevens, SOS Properties. Yes, here in California, had a property. We did a complete HVAC system and the inspection on our side passed, but made the homeowner tear out beautiful third room added in the garage, no permit. Yep, welcome to California. Yeah, I hate that stuff. 
I get it. You want to make sure it's permitted. But if the city is smart, they say, yeah, we want you to go through it. Because if you rip it down, and have to start from scratch. The issue is there is that your prop nine or 13. No, prop 13. I think it's prop 13. Property taxes are the same thing when you buy it for forever. Unless you permit something and then add on to it. And then I think you get reassessed. In New Hampshire, we get reassessed every single year. Or we don't get reassessed every year. We sort of do. Ch taxes change every year. It's the question of is the rate going up or is the assessment being adjusted? So every year that happens here. And so for them, the towns are smart. They say, hmm, if he has a garage there with a living unit on top of it, even though it's unpermitted, I don't want to tear it down if it's built safely. I would rather have him reassessed, pay the double fee because they don't charge you a single fee for an unpermitted space. They'll charge you double for it. So if it's a $1,500 permit, it's a $3,000 permit, it's the penalty. Um, but then you'll also get reassessed. And then that added living space will add to your assessment and increase the, the value of the property. Um, so you'll be paying more in taxes. So they're smart here. They don't do it that way. They want to make sure they're getting as much tax dollars as they possibly can. Rob, no Lake Las Vegas. I haven't looked at Lake Las Vegas yet, but I had seen it a, 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 maybe 10 years ago. Lori Faisal, um, how and where do you look up info on neighborhoods with poor soil for building on or uh, a reputation of particular builders? There's one in the area in my market where all the basements have water leakage, can see in picks. Um, <laughs> building inspection, code enforcement. That's where I would go. It's not a place you can look it up, I don't think. Not a place you can look it up. I would I would get in front of them. I would get in front of them, have the conversation. Yep. And I would say, you have to ask the question properly. It needs to be posed something like, hey, you know, if it's something that you're building, then probably better business bureau, maybe the code enforcement. If it's something you're buying that was built, if it's a 19th century home, meaning it was built in the 1800s, they're probably long gone. Um, and so it really just comes as to what you're working with. In most cases, most, not all, you can actually cure any water issues by just getting the water away from the foundation of the building. So many people are dumb and lazy or dumb or lazy. Um, so many people are dumb or lazy. And so what they will, what you'll literally see them do um, is you will see that they won't put the curved downspout or they'll put the curved downspout, but they use that long of a spout, which means it shoots out there and then fills in the ground. And then guess what happens? Water finds its way. So what you have to do is really bring it out away from the building, i.e. with a tube or i.e. bring it down to like one of those, uh, what do they call those things? Diffusers. Diffusers. It's like a green thing or it can be any color you want. It starts off small and it starts opening up like this and it goes out like two feet, two and a half feet. Those are okay. Those are good to have. Just make sure you don't put it on your driveway so it turns into a sheet of ice in the wintertime. Um, cash flow giant arrears. My tax lady is an EA. She's awesome. That's awesome. They're the best. They really are. Um, ask Lebo about Las Vegas, Lake Las Vegas. I definitely will. Cashflow Johnny Ramirez, Rentbox has been great collecting data and learning my market so quickly at the same time. Awesome. Yeah, that's what I rent, that's what I invented the Rentbox for is because I get the, oh, you overpaid for that property. Oh yeah? Yeah, what were you getting for rents? What was your rent number? 2,000 bucks, that's a mash you can get around here. I'm getting 3,000 bucks, dummy. Why do the numbers work for me? I didn't overpay. I overpaid based on how little he's getting for rent. I'm getting... $3,000 more or three, $3,000 for the unit, 2,000 more for the duplex. Guess what? He's dumb. He only offered, I think on that property, he offered 505. I offered 525. I like my number 525, a lot more with 3000 bucks aside than his at 505 at 2000 bucks aside. So he thinks I overpaid. I didn't correct him and say, yeah, I'm getting a lot more in rents. I'll do it here. Cause I know he doesn't watch me. But that's fine. Yeah, no joke. Uh, Jernil Diaz. Hey, Jernil. Morning, all. Lake Las Vegas is in an area about, yep, 20 minutes southeast of Henderson area. Yep. 
nice area, but HVAC wise, the condenser is cooled from water in the lake and is a nightmare to repair. Oh, interesting. I did HVAC in Vegas for 10 years. Very interesting. Thank you, Jamil. Are we hearing any water problems over there? Because I don't know if we are. I haven't looked there yet. They don't use air-cooled condensers. Uh, LV teach me. Company was happy to. Yeah. Yeah. Pet. And Matt, most common service call for us is certain rooms not cooling down due to poor engineering of the home. Yep. So please make sure the inspector does checks cooling for every room. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, Daniel Diaz at Matt Bittner. Um, most around Lake Las Vegas are geothermal cooled AC from the water in the lake. I did not know that. Interesting. Interesting, interesting. Uh, Kane Koo, thanks for the input. You're very welcome. Happy to do it. Matt Bittner, Daniel Diaz, the low lake level is probably a game changer. If it's Lake Las Vegas, yes, Lake Mead is having a real hard time right now. Yeah, real hard time right now. But definitely, I'm absolutely watching. I appreciate you guys. Roldan, you did it. Awesome. <laughs> Very cool. Um, yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, that is definitely a problem in Lake Mead. So I'm watching it. I, I agree with you guys all. I'm not blindly saying, no matter what's going on at Lake Mead, I'm buying there. In all honesty, I want people to get panicked. I want people to think that it's a horrible thing to own there and that Lake Mead's going to dry up and that there's not going to be any water there. I want that to happen. That makes $3 million homes a million bucks. So I'm okay with that. Oh, said something to annoy people, 15 people. That's okay, guys. I don't mind. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Yes, Lake Mead is at all-time low level. Yep. But unsure of how Las Vegas is now. Yep. Or Lake Vegas. Yep. Haven't lived in Vegas for 10 years. Okay. Thanks, Janil. Andrew P. Afternoon. Andrew P. Afternoon. Another one of my silly supporters. You're not silly. You're a supporter of my silly. I appreciate that because I, I enjoy being funny or silly. It's just not rocket science. Let's have fun, right? Matt Bittner, have you seen the HGTV South Park episode? I have not. I don't watch South Park. I have kids around and I'd be too <laughs> not appropriate for a four and three year old. Um, and if they think it's, if they see it's a cartoon, they're like, oh, look, a cartoon. No, not acceptable. Um, any chance for Dion, Dion talk, any chance for a Matt and Ashley live again? Yes, definitely. I don't know when, but we, we talked about that maybe like a week ago. We're definitely going to do another one. I think we're trying to, yes, we definitely will. We have a lot more flexibility in the winter time because in the summertime, we're kind of go, go, go with getting projects done and getting all everything set up for accounting and stuff. And so we're getting kind of caught up from Eliana's treatment. And so we expect to be kind of fully caught up with everything in our systems. We did a major system change over to door loop, which I love their system. It's been so much, so awesome. Um, and yeah. So yes. Um, Daniel Smith, big help. Thank you. You're welcome. Wife will be there searching for a job. Uh, should we move for a job? Should we move up there? So wanted to be near both metros if possible, give her more options. Yeah. Awesome. I'm glad that was helpful. We'd love to have you here in the Granite State. Um, and so, yeah, those areas are the ones that I would definitely hit. Um, you'll find others. Um, you'll find some others, but those are the those are the big ones that are the best known, best developed, um, no crime. Like those those are, and they're a little bit more expensive. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, Chester is more rural. Epping is more rural. Um, Exeter and Stratum both have their parts of rural, but they're definitely more commercialized where kind of everything you always need access to is right there. Um, Epping is very commercialized um, on the core on the 125 corridor um, and Chester, you're driving to Epping or to Manchester for pretty much everything. Um, so we used to make a joke about the town that we lived in next to Chester. We used to say, it's awesome. It's 20 minutes from anything. It's great. And then after living there for about a year, we're like, oh, it sucks. It's 20 minutes from anything. Same story. Yep. It's pretty funny. Um, that's all. How do you become, how do you become a student? So I did it. Um, 
I wanted to have students that were people that I knew that way, if I could see the dynamic, um, I could also test out everything. It's all stuff that I had done, but I wanted to see that students could do it too, with no experience, not knowing what they're doing, kind of anticipate or see what questions they would have to try and help make the course better. Um, so there is a course coming, um, still in development, but we've actually had a couple students kind of go through it. Um, and so that's been, that's been really good. Um, we learned some great things from it. Um, and so that's the big thing is that I just want to make sure that it's valuable to people, which I now know that it will be. Um, but even more so is we'll then have um, the ability to kind of continue to add to it as well. Um, doo -doo -doo -doo. Thank you for answering all my questions, Matt. Have a great day. Appreciate your time. Eric, you're very welcome. Enjoy the rest of your day. Uh, Rob, later, Matt. Got to go power wash my house to prepare for painting. That sounds like fun. It's in San Diego, so it couldn't be all bad. Um, Janiel, any updates on your course in March? Yes. So the, the course, we are final outlining everything. We've got a couple videos already done. Um, and then on the shirts, I'm being told that they will be here in two weeks. I'm very excited. We changed. So we finally got the shirt that we wanted, the, the blank, what's called. We finally got the blank that we wanted. And then um, we got, we finally got the blank that we wanted. And then the printer that we had, <laughs> oh, the printer that we had sucked. Like the quality was not there. I was beyond peeved. So we have changed the blank. We have the blank that we want. And now we have another printer and we're getting our next test run of shirts. Um, on like in two weeks, I think the second week, uh, two weeks. Yeah. Yeah. Like the second, uh, end of the first week of August, beginning of the second week, right around there. And then we'll put those up on the website. Cause I'm not going to do like a fulfillment service. Like, you know, we'll, we'll touch them and get them out to people. If you order them. Ryan, I think the interstate covenants reduce the amount of water CA would get if the Lake Mead levels drop to a certain level. Yes. That is why I'm not worried about water in Las Vegas. Yeah, Brian, so that makes sense. There's some aqueduct that there's actually under contract, I believe, um, that pulls that water. And so I believe that there's not only that, but there's also the contract. And so if Las Vegas looks at it and says, this doesn't, you know, we need to serve our, our citizenry first, then that's what they end up doing. Um, Matt Bittner, what are your thoughts on buying precious metals? I have lots of precious metal. I do. Um, yeah, I do. I have lots of precious metal. Um, silver, gold, fractionalized gold. Yep. So I have it, have it all. Um, I continue to add right now. I'm adding to my position. I think silver's in for a rough time, but which is fine. That's when I use it to accumulate. It's okay. Um, I've bought as low as five bucks because I've been doing it a long time. I bought as low as five. I've sold as high as 50. Um, and I've bought as high as 27 or 28. I bought as high as right around there. So yeah, I'm all for it. diversification in that way for me where it's physical. That's a different story. I do have some crypto, but not much. Um, it's much more like, you know, if one of the coins hits, I think, so I have ether. If that hits 50,000 bucks someday, let's say. Okay. If it doesn't, if it goes to zero. Okay. I have NFTs too. So, yep, I have it all. Ryan Allen, sports cards too. Ryan Allen, what is your opinion on such on this situation? Okay, right. I think I am thinking about borrowing the funds for a down payment from a family member. Okay. What kind of percentage would you offer thinking 30K for three years? Uh, 
Um, what are they doing with that 30K? Like, the reason I ask is if they have it in like a money market that's paying them 1%, double it, triple it, 2%, 3%, whatever, right? Because it has to be advantageous for you to borrow it as well as it is for them to lend it out. If they've got it sitting in some bank account that's giving them 0 0.0125 or if they have it in some money market that's paying them 0 0.5 or if they have it in some you know, one year uh, treasury that, I don't know, is still paying sub 1%. But at two years though, you can get, what is what is the rate on two years? It's like 3%. They have it in a regular savings account. Yeah. Regular, I mean, that's where I just had the conversation with them and asked them what, the, what they're comfortable doing. You know, what would you be comfortable with? That's what I would do. What would you be comfortable with? but they're also close to retirement. Yeah. I mean, at the end of the day, if they're close, I mean, is it really risky what you're doing with the 30 grand? Or is it one of those things where it's like, you could still easily make them, you know, payments on it if you lost your job and your rents went down. <sighs> Excuse me. I didn't get an awesome night's sleep last night. Andrew P, can you talk about staying in your lane from a spending perspective, even while you were doing well financially? Comments from friends, coworkers, perhaps pushing you to spend more, deserve it, et cetera. Oh yeah, dude, that happened all the time. Yeah, for sure. Um, I think the biggest difference was you know, one of the big things was we waited to have kids because we waited to have kids. We could wait on not going on vacations. Um, I have friends that go on vacations that are 10 and $12,000. I have a friend who got married, went on a $8,000 honeymoon and he rents. Not by choice. Honest to God. When Ashley and I paid for our wedding, um, we actually talked about it and said, we want to make sure that there's these people to celebrate with us because um, it's, it's going to be the only day and the most special day for us. So, and we want them to be there for that because they were there for our relationship. So we wanted that, but we also were like, we're not going to put ourselves in the poor house doing it. And so I think that we did gowns, tuxedos, honeymoon, everything all in. I think we were about 10 grand, everything, food, reception, everything. And we were comfortable with that because we saw friends that got married and spent 30,000 bucks and 40,000 bucks on their wedding. We're just like, you got rocks in your head. Don't, didn't get it. Didn't get it. And so the biggest thing was just what, understanding that other people were going to get things before us. We didn't just place our value in that stuff. So it was like, I mean, I was making six figures driving to and from a job and I was driving a car that was worth about that. I paid 700 bucks for. And people would laugh. They're like, when are you going to spend your money? I was like, Oh, spending it on buying real estate. None of them are retired at 45 and I will be. So yeah, I take it with a grain of salt. Take it with a grain of salt, you know. Um, broke loves company. I don't know. I, for me, it was just like, as you guys can tell, I'm I'm pretty broken about stuff like that. Like what other people think. I, yeah, just mm, kind of broken about that. Um, just because I have my goal and I know who my people are. My people are spending time with my wife, spending time with my kids, spending time with my smart circle of friends, um, spending time with, you know, and... I, I mean, as not, this is not a humble brag. This is just like fact. Like I probably have, you know, my three or four closest friends. I have more than all of them combined, probably times three. It's not a competition that way for me. It's more just a recognition of, you know, Hey, I'm to a point now where, now we can start spending. Now we can start doing, but that's the toughest part. That's what Deanna and I talked about in my retire in the retirement video. We well, he struggles with that now because he's you know 
he's going to, he's going to have a hard time spending the amount of money that he has. And I told him, I said, that's fine. I was like, well, all my kids start calling you uncle Dion. You can send him to college because I'm not sending him to college. So yeah, I think it's just being focused on your goal and recognizing that other people's spending habits is going to get them to their goal. Your spending habits are going to get you to yours. So that's where I think it is. Um, hopefully that was helpful. Uh, right now, no, I just don't have enough cash right now, but would uh, would with a good building over time. Okay. Yeah, I think it's really, I, yeah, I think, I think unless you know what you're going to do with that money, I wouldn't be borrowing it. Um, if you know what you're going to do with that money, then I would just offer them a rate that, that they feel good about. Just you have to commit inside internally that no matter what happens, that you're going to pay the money back. You have to. You have to. If they're close to retirement, you have to. Andrew P., off topic, but thank you in advance. You're welcome. Cassidy Ironman. Hey, Cassidy. Good morning. Hope the rebranding search is going well. We finally had the baby. I was going to, that was my next question. Oh, dear heavens. 11, 6, and 24. Whoa, your wife is awesome. Wow. 47 hours of labor. Between you and me, don't share this with her. That is more labor than my wife had combined on all three of our kids. She is a superstar. My wife's a superstar too, but that's incredible. Congratulations. Uh, Matt Bittner, Lumberjack Landlord. Having a wedding at the Justice of the Peace is the way to go. So Matt, on that note, I told Ashley, I said, let's go to Las Vegas. We invite just our first, just our closest friends. And I said, your parents can come and whatever, like, but just a really small group of people. And then we'll come back and we'll have a reception here. Um, she didn't want to do that. I love that. And now it's really funny. I think when we, I think maybe like seven or eight years into marriage, she was like, should have done that. <laughs> she said, yeah, should have done that. I agree with her. We should have done that. Um, yeah. Cause I had, I had, a, I had only one. So most of it was like combined friends or her family. Um, my table only had like four people at it Four uh, four people and their wives. Um, it was basically four of my closest buddies. That's what it was. Um, Ronald Zion. Hey, Ronald. Hi, Matt. I'm interested in using yard space for positive cash flow. In today's building market, it is more cost effective to build an ADU tiny house. Yep. That's 400 square feet or buy one pre-made. Um, it really depends. Um, it depends on your market where you're deploying it um, because you have to meet certain codes for insulation, electrical, things like that. So what you want to do is you want to talk to code enforcement in your town and ask them, are there any tiny homes that were built or are there any that are manufactured that you guys have already approved? That's what you want to do. Or you call the state. Um, your local code enforcement should know that. And if they don't just call your state code enforcement, because usually they've seen something where they've said, yeah, that meets the standard. Um, as far as more cost effective, it really depends. Concrete in some areas is crazy expensive and others it's not. Um, if you want to have like a tiny home on a trailer, that's one thing. If you want to have a tiny home on where you're literally putting it on a, a slab. That's another thing. Um, so a lot of variables to that. So I don't know that there's, I'll have more information coming on that. I'm getting my drawings finished for my ADU. Um, and so once I get those drawings done and we position it and put it with the town, we'll find out. And I get into it, I'll give you hard numbers. Andrew Pete, that's awesome. I think you figured it out. Happy for you guys. Thank you, I appreciate that. You made the tough choices and it paid off. Yes. Yeah. I appreciate that. Yeah, we definitely did. Yeah. Ashley was awesome. She was, I mean, like I talked about, you know, we, we had the conversation where she was going to be able to stay here, not go to work. She's going to be able to stay home with the kids um, or, or stay home with the kids eventually get her degree and then start a career, then build a career, and then have something to go back to when the kids got into school where she could work mommy hours. Um, Cause that's the thing is she wants to be able to, and I want her to, she's an amazing nurse. I, and she has a gift at it. She's really good at it. Um, the number of cards that she got from, um, from patients 
um, were just amazing. And so I want her to be able to do that and feel satisfied and fulfilled with that outside of just being an amazing wife, just being an amazing mom. If she's skilled at that, she's good at it. I want her to enjoy that and have her own accolades. Um, and so from doing that, it, it will be great when the kids are all in school, then she'll go back to being a nurse and she'll start nursing again, which will be awesome. Um, Dawn, I need to go access a property tenant just told me they moved out of because they bought a house. Oh, interesting. Hopefully not too bad. Have it listed for sale. Oh, man. Hey, Karumba. Dawn, let me know how it goes, man. Let me know how it goes. Right now, does, uh, does 30K for three years and a balloon of 36K sound like a reasonable offer? I know they won't ask for anything in interest, so just looking for another option. Yeah, I think that's good. Yeah, I think that's, I think that's good. I think what I would do if I were in your shoes is I would probably be putting some money away towards it is what I'd probably be doing. That way you don't come up with this massive payment that you have to do something with. Um, and not know how to do, you know, not have the money to do it. Right now, and how is the project you have to add the floor to the property going? That's the same as my ADU project. Both of those plans are in progress now with the architect, and I'm just waiting for the plans back. He goes down to Florida and takes like a month off in the summertime. I don't know why he goes in the summer. I think it's because of his son's schedule, but he just goes down in the summertime for a month and then comes back. So he doesn't do a whole lot of work when he's down there, and that was kind of understood because we weren't in a rush. Andrew P, I know, I know you know this, but working with parents directly, I know how much they value an amazing experience versus the average bedside manner. Super cool. Uh, with patients, parents. Um, but working with patients directly, I know you know. Yes. Oh, yeah, for sure. Amazing. Yeah, for sure. Yep. Yep. Sure. I totally agree. Yeah. Ashley's an amazing, amazing nurse. She's spectacular. She really is. It's really funny, kind of the running joke that we have is when I get sick, I'm like, I thought I'd pre put you in nursing school for a reason. This care sucks. She, she always looks at me with a cross look. She's like, do you need more attention than the three kids? I was like, right now I do. I feel really sick. <laughs> yes, we have fun here. <laughs> yes. Matt, do you have any outgoing, uh, have any outgoing marketing? No, I'm not doing any yet. Mm -mm. Nope. Our market's still way, 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 way too hot. Um, eight days ago, three houses under contract, 20 over 30 over 50 over properties. Way too, way too expensive. Wait, stuff. Our, our, um, our inventory is up seven days worth seven days, seven days. Yeah. It's, I need people to start feeling it. Yeah. And not in July and August because people still buy stuff now. So I really need to start seeing it in like September, October. That's what I'm really kind of getting everything ready for because September and October is when the magic starts to happen because it's going to be starting to get cold. Everybody's in school. Um, nobody wants to move in the wintertime here. So that's where, that's where the magic starts to happen. Cool. Well, guys, it was an awesome time hanging out with you. I'm going to cut it a little bit short today because it's 95 degrees. I'm boiling over here and I want to spend some time with my kids in the pool hanging out. But it was awesome hanging out with you guys. I hope you have a super awesome week. Don't forget Tuesday's live stream with Dion, 4 p.m. Pacific, 7 p.m. Eastern time. Three Amigos on Thursday. Um, and then I got a, a video coming out with Millennial Mike, a reaction to how a landlord handled a rent increase to a tenant wasn't wrong. It was wrong. And so I'm going to just walk you through that video and share with you what I would have done differently and then take it for as you guys uh, would use it. Uh, what do you, Matt Bittner, what do you think about using bandit signs for marketing? Do you use them? I don't use bandit signs. Um, I have an air conditioner. I have central, I have a lot of air conditioner in my house. It's just, um, it's not nearly as cool as my pool. Um, I don't use bandit signs. I don't use them. Nope. Our towns uh, are really strict on them. I've spent 20 years building a reputation. I'm just not willing to ruin for a deal like that. We'll find them. We'll find them the other way for sure. We'll get them through the mailer uh, or through a mailer. We'll do one. We're prepping one now. We'll see what we, we'll see what we deliver, but we will do one. Um, it's going to be targeted. 
Um, but uh, yeah, we'll do a series of mailers to a targeted list of people. Um, just not now. It's not the time. Stuff is way too expensive. Everybody and their neighbor still puts stuff out there. And if it's reasonably priced at all, they get it. If it's unreasonably priced, I don't want to be the one that has to talk them down. So we'll figure that piece out for sure. Awesome. Guys, have a fantastic week. I appreciate you all. If you haven't hit the like button already, please make sure you hit it on the way out. And uh, yeah, don't forget Dion's live stream on Tuesday. Um, I may stop in. He gave me the link, so I may be able to stop in and do that. And then Millennial Mike stuff. And then Mike Zuber wonder until the time I watch stuff this weekend. And then I do have all the materials needed for the Shark Bite review, as well as another secret special review that you guys don't know about that I'm very excited to bring to you guys because I think it's going to crush it. It'll be awesome. So you guys have a fantastic. And I did try the live, real quick, um, Bittner. I did try the live stream by my, by my pool. It's with young kids with water and splashing. It's too much of a problem. <laughs> so guys, have a great week. I appreciate y'all. Like, subscribe on your way out and have an awesome week. We'll talk to you guys soon. Take care.